On this set of tapes, you are listening to Dr. Howard C. Estep of World Prophetic Ministry in Colton, California, teaching the book of the Acts. Here is Dr. Estep as he speaks from the King is Coming Auditorium with lesson number 24, Acts chapter 24, verses 1 through 27. If you'll open your Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 24, and we find that Paul is involved here with being sent before Felix, the procurator, uh, and Paul is having quite a problem. In fact, we've had nothing but problems with Paul for the last four or five weeks as we've been studying our lesson. Chapter 24, lesson outline, 1, Paul before Felix, verses 1 through 9. The second point, Paul defends himself before Felix, this is verses 10 through 21. Three, Paul's trial delayed, verses 22 through 23. And four, Paul preaches to Felix, verses 24 through 26. And five, lastly, Paul silenced for two years, verse 27. We have four more lessons, and then we will have finished the book of Acts, 28 lessons. Let's begin in the book of Acts, chapter 24, verse 1. Paul before Felix, verse 1 through 9. And after five days, Ananias, the high priest, descended with the elders and with a certain orator named Tertullus, who informed the governor against Paul. So we have this fellow Ananias, and he's over in chapter 23, verse 5. We have this same man mentioned. Then said Paul, I wish not, brethren, that he, referring to Ananias, that he was the high priest. For it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. In other words, we had Ananias in chapter 23, and Paul is saying here in 23 verse 5 that he was ignorant of this man Ananias. He really didn't know he was a high priest, and really he wasn't a high priest. For he had been deprived of his office by the Romans, and so he had snuck back into office later on, and Paul wasn't aware of it. So now we find in 24 verse 1 that Ananias the high priest descends with the elders and with a certain orator, and who informed the governor against Paul. In other words, Paul had quite a situation prevailing in the city of Jerusalem. The Bible says the whole city was in an uproar. And Paul had to be taken into the castle in order to defend his very life. And we find this situation still prevailing here. They're trying to get rid of Paul. Verse 2, And when he was called forth, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Seeing that by thee we enjoy great quietness, and that very worthy deeds are done unto this nation by thy providence. In other words, Tertullus, the orator, is before Felix, and what he's going to do, he's going to flatter him. He's going to flatter uh, Felix, the procurator, and he does so in the middle of verse 2 where he starts this system of softening him up. Seeing that by thee, referring to Felix, we enjoy great quietness, because there had been an uprising in Jerusalem, and Felix had been responsible for quelling the disturbance and bringing peace to the troubled city. We enjoy great quietness, and that very worthy deeds are done unto this nation by thy providence. In other words, he's saying here that by your care and your oversight and your ability to be a good administrator, you have really given us good government. I guess that's the way you have to do politicians because we see Paul doing it here over 1,900 years ago. Paul is before Felix. Verse 3, and uh, Tertullus is continuing his uh, remarks of flattery in verse 3. We accept it always and in all places, most noble Felix, with all thankfulness notwithstanding that I be not further tedious unto thee, I pray thee that thou wouldst hear us 
of thy clemency a few words. Now, what he's saying here, notwithstanding that I be not further tedious unto you, he's saying that I may neither trespass on your time nor enumerate your many deeds. In other words, I don't want to take your time, Governor, our most exalted Felix. I don't want to bother you by enumerating all of these things and flatter you and take a lot of time. But he's saying that I wish that we could have some clemency shown toward this man that I'm representing. Verse 5, for we have found this man a pestilent fellow, a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. I'll give you the four accusations in just a few moments. Verse 6, who also hath gone about to profane the temple, whom we took and would have judged according to our law. He's a Jew. He's before a Roman court, Roman procurator Felix. Now, we could have taken this man and we could have judged him according to the Jewish law, verse 7, but the chief captain, Lysias, came upon us and with great violence took him away out of our hands. In other words, the head of the Roman army in Jerusalem came and took this man from us. You remember a uh, lesson or so back when it looked like Paul was going to be killed the man that was the head of the Roman army stationed there in Jerusalem sent troops into the mob and rescued Paul and took him into a castle, closed the iron gate and preserved his life. And so this is actually what he's rehearsing here in verse 7. And with great violence took him away out of our hands, verse 8, commanding his accusers to come unto thee by examining of whom thyself mayest take knowledge of all these things whereof we accuse him. And the Jews also assented, saying that these things were so. Actually, we have four accusations of the Apostle Paul. One, it was a term, this, this phrase here, we have found this man a pestilence fellow. He, he really, he was a pest. You know, you've run upon people in your lifespan that just, you see them coming, but uh, you're just better when they aren't around. So this seemed to be, and when you go back through the book of Acts, you find that Paul was continually, everywhere he went, the thing blew up. Chaos was the order of the day. So he said he's a pestilent fellow, meaning he's a pest. This is the number one accusation. It was a term used by current authors of very bad people. He did not say that he was a pestilent fellow, but a pestilence within himself. In other words, wherever Paul went, things happened. Number two, he was guilty of sedition. Sedition meant a stirring up of the people to arouse them to anger. Sedition, sedition was uh, accusation against the government. So he was a pest, he was seditious. Number three, he was a ringleader of heresy. In other words, anything that was contrary to Judaism was considered heresy. And so Paul was a ringleader of heresy. Number four, he was a defiler of the Jewish temple. So this man is saying. So he has these four counts against him. He was a pest, he was seditious, he was uh, guilty of heresy, and he defiled the Jewish temple. So Paul looks like he's in bad, bad trouble. So we have from 1 to 9, in chapter 24, Paul is brought before Felix. Well, who is this fellow Felix? Let's just take a little look and see. Felix was a free man made so by a ruler by the name of Claudius, Felix, born Antonius Claudius, a Greek subject, and some way or another he became a free man, and then he was given the surname Felix. Felix evidently thought that he could do as he pleased. It is said of him, according to historians, he reveled in cruelty and lust. 
and wielded the power of a king with the mind of a slave. He began his career as a procurator of Judea by seducing Drusilla, the sister of Agrippa II, and then he married her because she was Jewish, at least one side of her family. He learned much of the Jewish life and the customs of the Jewish people. So we find Paul appearing before that type of a man, a Roman, married to a Jewish woman who was not his wife, but he had taken her from another man. And so this is the situation that Paul finds himself suddenly thrust in front of a man who has the power to judge him. Paul defends himself before Felix. This is verses 10 through 21. Now, how is a godly Jew who has turned from Judaism to Christianity going to defend himself in a Roman court of law before a man who has had the facts presented to him that Paul is a pest, he's a leader of sedition, uh, he's a man who has defiled the temple, he's a man who is a ringleader of heresy, and so Felix sees this little Jew standing in front of him, and he must have some kind of a mental picture of this individual. So how is Paul going to defend himself? Verses 10 through 12, 21, 10 through 21. Then Paul, after that the governor had beckoned unto him to speak, answered. In other words, Paul's going to give his defense. The other fellow had given his side of the picture. Now Felix is going to let Paul give his story. So he beckoned unto Paul to speak. For as much as I know that thou hast been of many years a judge unto this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself. Because that thou mayest understand that there are yet but twelve days since I went up to Jerusalem for to worship. Four days of the seven purifying himself in the temple, according to chapter 21, verse 27. Four days purifying himself. The fifth day he gave his defense before the Sanhedrin in chapter 23, verses 1 through 10. That night he saw the Lord, 23, verse 11. The sixth day the forty Jews plotted to kill him. You remember they took an oath that they had not shaved, nor would they uh, eat food. That was on the sixth day. And that night the soldiers took him to Antipatris. The seventh day he was brought to Caesarea, the capital of the Roman Empire, are in Palestine and presented him to Felix. And five days later, he's on trial before Felix. Thus he says, 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem. In other words, he's saying, 12 days ago, I was up in Jerusalem for to worship. Verse 12. And they neither found me in the temple disputing with any man, neither raising up the people, neither in the synagogue nor in the city. Now, he's previously been accused on four accounts. Now he's defending himself. He's making it plain what he was doing, where he was, and so forth. Verse 13, neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. That's a pretty strong statement when you're accused of heresy, defiling the temple, and any man who's guilty of defiling the temple in Jerusalem or in Israel could be instantly put to death. He had no recourse. And Paul says they can't prove any of the things that they've accused me of in verse 13. Verse 14, But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers. They accused him of heresy. Any religion that was contrary to Judaism could be labeled heresy. So Christianity in the first century, anybody that adopted Christianity, they could be accused of heresy. And you can see the great struggle that went on there in uh, Palestine in the first century as people were switching over from Judaism to Christianity, immediately they were guilty of heresy. 
and they could be brought before the courts and they could be killed and they were ostracized from their families. They were cut off of their inheritance from their families. Tremendous situation. We really don't have the experience of suffering and being put to the test today like those people did in the first, second, and third century, especially in the first century. We really don't know what it means to suffer. We haven't had anybody say, if you go over there to the King is Coming Auditorium, if you go there to a Bible study, I don't want you to ever darten into my door again. Don't ever come into this house again. I don't want you to stick your feet under my table and eat my food. You're not coming back here if you go over there. And that's what they did in that day, but we don't have that. Those people were really tough. Middle of verse 14. Believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. He's saying that he believed as a Jew all things that were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets. Roman law forbade any man to introduce any new religion or object of worship. Paul's reference to the God of my fathers was a defense for both judge and accusers to hear. So he's making it plain that as a Jew, I worship the God of our fathers. Verse 15, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. Now he's going just a step further in this particular circumstance. He's saying here uh, that he believes in a resurrection of the just and the unjust. And uh, Paul was of the sect that didn't believe in the resurrection of the unjust, only the just. But Paul says, I believe in the just and the unjust being resurrected because Paul teaches in his uh, epistles the judgments that... Uh, the souls and the spirits are subjected to after death. And so he's bringing it out here, even in this book of Acts, as we have the history of the early church. And he is saying that he is declaring that he held no doctrine contrary to truth. At no time was I contrary to truth, nor worshipped contrary to God, and no malice to man. See, they accused him in the first nine verses. They accused him of being a pest and being a leader of sedition and uh, being a ringleader of heresy and being a defiler of the temple. And he's counteracting with his defense here that he, those charges are not so. Nobody can prove that. Let's proceed on. Verse 17. Now, after many years, I came to bring alms to my nation and offerings. And this is a regular custom of Jews to take alms. Alms was that offering that they brought for the poor people. And all Jews are required to do that. They were in that day. They are today. They take an offering for poor people. Paul says that he brought his alms to for the poor people, to my nation and offerings. Verse 18, whereupon certain Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple. He was going through the ritual of purification. And when he was in the temple, certain Jews found him there involved in that while engaged in the offerings of purification in the temple. This goes way back into the law of Moses in the book of Numbers chapter 6. Neither with multitude nor with tumult. Verse 16. I wasn't causing a commotion. There was no tumult going on. There was no multitude gathered around. And these accusations that you have laid upon my shoulders, he says in so many words, I declare that they're false. Nobody can prove them. Verse 18. Whereupon certain Jews from Asia found me purified or being purified. In the temple, verse 19, who ought to have been here before thee. These people that have been accusing me 
How come they aren't here to publicly accuse me to my face? That's what verse 19 is saying. Who ought to have been here before thee and object if they had aught against me. Verse 20. Or else let these same here say, if they have found any evil doing in me while I stood before the council, except it be for this one voice that I cried standing among them, touching the resurrection of the dead, I am called and questioned by you this day. I want to read Paul's defense, the points that are involved in Paul's defense. Number one, introduction, respect for the qualifications of justice in his judge. We're looking at Paul's defense. It was in three parts. One, the introduction. What's the introduction? Respect for the qualifications of justice in his judge. Number two, he's refuting the charges. This consisted of four parts to answer four accusations. One, I am not a plague or a pestilence, he said, but a true worshiper of God. Two, I am not a defiler of the temple. Three, I am not a troublemaker among the Jews in any place. Four, they cannot prove one violation of any law. The third part of his defense, the affirmation, this consisted of a twelve-fold Pauline confession. Let's pick that up again. The affirmation. He's affirming his faith. This consists of a twelve-fold Pauline confession. Real quickly, one, I am a heretic according to them. Now he says, I am a heretic according to them, but not necessarily according to God. Two, I am a true worshiper of God. Three, I believe all that is written in the law and the prophets. Four, I have hope in God. Five, I believe in the resurrection of the just and the unjust. Six, I strive for a conscience void of any offense to God or man. Seven, I brought alms, offerings for the poor people, and offerings to the poor of my nation. Eight, the only wrong they caught me doing was purifying myself in the temple according to the law of Moses. Verse 18 is where that's recorded. Nine, I was doing this privately and without any tumult. Ten, these men are not my accusers as they of Asia accuse me. Eleven, these men have not accused me of sin before their counsel. Twelve, the only evil I committed in their counsel was a confession that I believed in the resurrection. So when you analyze this man, Paul, and you see what he stood for, and the great stand that he took for the word of God, it's marvelous when we take a retrospective view and we see how the devil opposed him. And you can see today how that we individually take a stand. Some of us in our homes or at the places where we labor, where we earn our livelihood. Sometimes we are attacked by the forces of evil because the devil doesn't want you to live the victorious Christian life. And he will turn circumstances against you at all levels in the school system in the places of employment, sometimes in the local churches, people will be turned against you. And Paul is bringing this all out here. He says they can't prove any of this. I'm not guilty of it. So what happens? Well, they delay his trial. He presented a good defense of himself. So there's a delay of his trial. This is our third point in our lesson outline. This is verses 22 through 23. And when Felix heard these things, and Paul must have just poured this out. He was an orator. He had an analytical mind. He could say things in such a way that people could understand it. And so 
when Felix heard these things, verse 22, having more perfect knowledge of that way, the way that Paul had been living, he deferred them and said, when Lysias, the chief captain, shall come down, I will know the uttermost of your matter. So we're going to call the chief captain of the Roman army from Jerusalem to come down. Then we're going to interrogate him, and then we'll get a complete picture of this whole situation because evidently Felix is thinking in his own mind, this guy isn't guilty. He must not be guilty of all of these charges because there was there were too many crumped up charges against this one man for one man to be that mean and to be guilty of so many things. So he says when this chief captain comes down, then we'll have a better knowledge of the understanding of this matter. Verse 23, And he commanded a centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty. In other words, he's going to uh, keep him under house arrest. That's basically what it meant. We're going to keep him in custody, but he's going to have the ability to have a certain amount of his liberty and his freedom. And this right here, this one thing that Felix did is proof that Felix knew he was not guilty of any of these crimes. Felix is Roman man. He's an intelligent man. He's the procurator of Judea. He's the man that procures taxes and does all of this of getting finances, much like a tax assessor or a collector of taxes would today. And so this man uh, realizes that this Paul can't be this bad. So we're going to just hold this thing off for a little while. So he gives him his liberty in the middle of verse 23, and that he should forbid none of his acquaintance to minister or come unto him. In other words, he's going to give him his freedom. People can come and go and see Paul and have a certain amount of liberty and fellowship and visitations. And Paul was a big shot in the church at Jerusalem. He's been on three missionary journeys in that part of the world. And a uh, tremendous knowledgeable man. And so he's going to have this time to rest, uh, live comfortably, have his friends visit him, and evidently God is going to speak to his heart during this period of rest and relaxation to prepare him because Paul is going to be writing a great part of the New Testament that we call the epistles and these lovely books of explanation of Christian living that we have in the New Testament. So we have the trial post postponed, and Paul is permitted liberty and visits from his friends. Now, Paul preaches to Felix. If you notice, in our past study of the book of Acts, when Paul left one town and went to another town, the first thing he did in this new town was put his suitcase under the bed where he was staying in the boarding house and then go over to the Jewish synagogue and start preaching. That was his pattern. So here he is in front of this very important Roman official, Felix, procurator of Judea. What does he do? It tells us in verses 24 through 26 what he did. And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, this lady was the daughter of King Herod Agrippa I. She left her first husband, married Felix, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. This man, Felix, must have had a spark in his soul that desired to know the truth. Now, he could have just brushed it off and said nothing to Paul, not even listened to him, but for some reason or other, he had this yearning in his heart, Felix did, and he wanted to know something about the great spirituality of this little Jew called Paul. So he sends for him in verse 24. He wanted to hear him concerning the faith in Christ. Verse 25. And as he reasoned with Felix, 
preaching to him, teaching him, instructing him, as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled. Isn't that amazing that the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, over 1,900 years ago, in a judgment hall of the Roman government in that part of the world, was just as powerful as it is today, hasn't changed a bit. And wherever a sinner will allow the word of God to pierce his cold, hard, indifferent heart, that individual gets right with God. Or he's motivated or moved toward God. And we see the same thing happening here in this magnificent palace they're in Palestine because Paul reasons with him of righteousness. Paul knew that this lovely woman that was sitting there on the throne beside him was not his wife, somebody else's wife. So he's reasoning of righteousness. He's reasoning of temperance, self-control, so forth, and judgment to come. And Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. You know, that's the same old story. You've heard it a hundred times in your life. I've heard it two hundred times in my ministry. Not tonight, mystery step, some other time. I don't feel like making the decision tonight, maybe tomorrow night. There's no more appropriate time than now. Now is the day of salvation. And Felix, though he was a very influential official in the Roman government in Palestine almost 2,000 years ago, he heard the gospel, he trembled, his hands got clammy. He was sweating around the neck. Beads of perspiration were flowing off of his, from his forehead down the side of his face. He was nervous. His tongue was stuck to the roof of his mouth. He was dry. He wanted a drink of water. He wasn't ready to make his decision for God. So he sent Paul away. He says, I will call for thee at a more convenient season, and that convenient season never came. Historians tell us that Drusilla, Felix's wife, with her son by her first husband, when Vesuvius in Italy erupted, that she was one of those and her son was one of those who were killed in the eruption of Vesuvius, the great mountain that blew up and the ashes came out and smothered that part of Italy. The historians give us this little insight in what happened to her. Meaning to say that when a sinner re does not repent, does not receive the gospel, does not accept the message of God's servant, if they turn their hearts up on that, turn their backs upon the way, God sends calamity upon them. And God is justified in doing it because they're going to hell anyhow. And so God brains judgment upon them. Verse 26. Why did Felix do that? Well, for two reasons. Number one, the gospel was getting close to his heart. Number two, he was a greedy individual. He was always looking for a little extra money. He was looking for bribes, looking for someone to uh, put extra, as we call it, money in his hand so he'd have extra finances. You'll notice this, verse 26. He hoped also that money should have been given him of Paul. Paul didn't have anything to start with. Paul was just a poor tent maker preaching the gospel. And in Paul's own words, in back lessons, we find that Paul said that he has maintained himself with his own hands. He provided everything that he needed. He was never a burden upon any congregation. But yet we find Felix in verse 26 
turning Paul aside, hoping that money should have been given him of Paul that he might loose him. In other words, if Paul in our vernacular had said, listen, most honorable Felix, my people who like me and who have been touched by my ministry and people who have been converted by my preaching, uh, people on my mailing list, I think we could raise a thousand dollars, would you let me go? You see, politicians are still crooked today like they were then. They had water gates way back there. Why? Because men, and I'm talking about mankind, men never change of their own selves. The only thing that will change the conduct of mankind is the transformation of new birth by the Spirit of God and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And so this Felix, the procurator of Judea, well, he said, if, if I hear, give me the right amount of money, I'll let him go. Verse, that's the middle of verse 26. Wherefore, he sent for him the oftener. He must have propositioned him. He must have let it be known that he could be loosed for a certain amount of money because uh, he sent for him the more oftener and communed with him. That's a tragedy that we have that, but that's the way mankind is. Paul preaches to Felix. The result, nothing happened. Felix turned his back upon the gospel. Paul didn't change. Paul just kept preaching the gospel. Felix changed, but he changed for the worse. Because there's no record in the Bible anywhere that Felix ever repented of his sins and ever received Jesus Christ as his Savior. As far as we know, he died and went directly to hell. And his soul and spirit are in hell, in torment, and will remain there under the white throne judgment, at which time they will be taken out of the hell and then judged, shown that he had an opportunity when Paul was in his palace that day and he rejected Paul. And then Felix, at that time at the white throne judgment, will be thrown into the lake of fire according to the 20th chapter of the book of Revelation. It's amazing. What happens? Well, Paul gets another silence period. You notice God is constantly giving this man a time of rest. Isn't it good how God manifests himself to us as we come along to the later years of life? God is more gentle with us in our 60s, in our 70s, than he was in our 20s, in our 30s. And here's this dear Jew that has wandered all over Asia Minor, up into Syria, crossed over into what we now know as Turkey, up into uh, Europe, the southern part of Europe, down through Greece and shipwrecked and all this kind of things, three major missionary journeys, and now we find God giving him periods of recuperation. Here's one of them in verse 27. But after two years, Porcius Festus came unto Felix's room, or came into Felix's room, and Felix, willing to show the Jews a pleasure, left Paul bound. In other words, Paul could have been released for two years if he had paid a bribe. In other words, two years previous, he could have been a free man. But he didn't pay the bribe, therefore he didn't get it. So we find now that uh, there's another man coming on the scene, Porcius Festus. He was made a procurator in 60 AD. He wished to have the support of the priests, so sought to send Paul back to Jerusalem for trial, perhaps not knowing the reason for the request of the Jews. So Paul, after two years, still a prisoner, living in comfortable quarters with his friends visiting him, and I imagine that during all of this time Paul is studying. I know I would be. 
Because I remember years ago when I traveled across the country in Bible conference work, I really relished those times in those motel rooms when the doors were locked and I was sitting there with my Bible and a couple of books I carried with me and a little portable battery-operated dictaphone. That's where I wrote most of my books that I have available today, uh, over 170 books. I wrote most of them on the road when I was all alone and had nobody to disturb me. And I'm made to believe that when Paul was all alone uh, for these different periods, such as this two-year period, after Felix had uh, rejected the gospel and had tried to get Paul to give him a bribe, I'm believing, and I can't support it with Scripture, but I'm believing that Paul dug into the Word of God and he studied it. And I'm believing that the Holy Spirit revealed to him certain sections of the gospel and made it plain to him. Because when we get over into the Corinthians, first and second, and to Thessalonians, and then we get into these marvelous books that we have here in the uh, book of Hebrews, which we believe that Paul wrote, when we get into these marvelous books of Ephesians and Colossians, and Galatians in these books, we have to know that this man had a supernatural knowledge and understanding of the Bible that very few men have ever had. Where did he get it? When he was going through these times of testing. When he had these little episodes of relapse. When he wasn't being molested by the authorities, such as living in Caesarea for two years unmolested by the authorities, and his friends are coming to him, still a prisoner, under house arrest, but yet studying the Word of God. You'll find in your Christian life, and I found it true in my Christian life, that I grow stronger, and I come to the place where I can depend on myself in the sense that I know how much I can take. I get this strength in times of testing. Where is the steel tempered? When the blacksmith puts the piece of steel into the fire and it turns bright cherry red and brings it out and lays it on the anvil and begins to hammer it and shape it, the thing was tempered in the fire. It wasn't tempered on the anvil. It was tempered in the fire. And when we are undergoing persecution, or we are being severely tested, or we're having great trouble descend upon us, those are the times that we gather supernatural strength for the everyday task of living the Christian life. And mind you, my friends, don't ever ask God to remove the times of testing. Ask him to give you strength to endure them. Because as you endure them, you'll come out of those times of testing much stronger than you ever were in all of your life. So often Christians throw up the hands or they throw in the sponge or they quit or they... Uh, uh, explode like an Alka-Seltzer in a glass of hot water, and they go off the handle, as it were, when a little bit of trouble comes along. But if you can learn to endure and stay secure and fast and be staunch for God during the times of testing, then you'll never have any more problems, believe me. Never have any more problems because it's under those circumstances that you become strong in God. And when the voice of the accuser and the howling winds of destruction seem to be blowing against you, if you can keep your roots deep down in the soil of faith and depend on God, God will deliver you. It's that simple. The Apostle Paul, what a great man. Paul before Felix, verses 1 through 9. Paul defends himself before Felix, verses 10 through 21. 
Paul's trial was delayed, verses 22 through 23. And then Paul preaches to Felix, verses 24 through 26. And then he had a little respite or a time of resting in verse 27 when he was silenced for two years. For the next successive lesson on the book of the Acts, please take the next tape in the series and place it in your recorder, side one up.